How's it going guys? We have a medium difficulty question for rheumatology slash autoimmune disease for step one and step two. So uh, not going to be a lengthy clip here. I'll cut to the chase, uh, tell you the important points you need to know. Before we get started, please subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Give the video a like. I really appreciate it. Find me on Instagram at melman underscore medical. M-E-H-L-M-A-N underscore medical. Links down below. Find me on Telegram. The links to the Telegram group and channel are down below. Now start the clip. So 34-year-old woman, two-month history of pain and swelling in her knees and hands, accompanied by morning stiffness that usually lasts an hour. Physical exam shows tenderness and swelling of the metacarpal phalangeal joints and knees. Question wants to know the most likely finding to develop in this patient over the next 10 years. So past level diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, okay? We're handing you that diagnosis. But then we ask more challenging answer choices, the medium difficulty question overall. So let's just whip through the answer choices here. We'll go backwards. Choice E, soft P2, wrong fucking answer. This could be associated with pulmonic stenosis, okay? Part of Tetralogy of Fallot non-existent on US simile, okay? I mean, a loud P2, in contrast, very high yield for US simile, okay? Loud P2, or they can say loud pulmonic component of S2, or just a loud S2, they can say. There's no, there's no such thing as a loud A2 on US simile. If they say any loud P2 or loud S2, they want you to know pulmonary hypertension slash core pulmonale, okay? Which rheumatoid arthritis can cause pulmonary fibrosis. It's called rheumatoid lung. In addition to the fact that methotrexate, the first line DMARD for RA, is known to cause pulmonary fibrosis. So a patient can get ensuing pulmonary uh, fibrotic disease, and you say, well, is it rheumatoid lung from the RA directly? Is it from the methotrexate? It's probably a bit of both, okay? But you'd get a loud P2 in that case. Wrong fucking answer. Choice D, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, wrong answer. I put a more complex slash recondite sounding answer choice here because I'm aware that when students don't know an answer, they choose weird sounding shit. Okay, so if you were watching this clip and you didn't know and you chose D, wrong fucking answer. Okay, now I've seen this as a correct answer for what a patient could develop in theory post-MI. They'll give you a big paragraph. They'll say in the last line, they'll say patient has Q waves, which mean a patient's had a prior MI, okay, months to years ago. They can develop Q waves. They'll say patient has Q waves and leads 2, 3 AVF, history of inferior infarct. And if you have fibrosis of the myocardium from a prior infarction, that can cause electrical conduction abnormalities and increased risk of arrhythmia. So it's not that... It's this specific arrhythmia, the patients at increased risk score. It could be any arrhythmia. It could be atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. It really doesn't matter, okay? In this case, wrong fucking answer. Choice C, mid-systolic click, wrong answer, refers to uh, mitral valve prolapse. A lot we can talk about, most common rumor, almost always uh, benign slash asymptomatic. And Mike Somatis degeneration, Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos, increased propensity for, to develop this. Uh, so much to talk about. I could mention that on one of the 2CK forms, you need to know something called mitral valve prolapse syndrome, okay, where it can very rarely be, a, uh, very rarely be symptomatic, where a patient will have a fleeting chest pain, is how they describe it colloquially, fleeting chest pain on the left, 20 or 30 episodes in a patient who's otherwise young, or young and healthy, uh, 20s or 30s years of age. And as I just fucking said, fleeting chest pain, it's mitral valve, and they'll say there's a mid systolic click. It's just mitral valve prolapse syndrome, and the answer to that question is no treatment necessary. Wrong fucking answer. Choice B, diffuse ST segment elevations is the correct answer. So this is the ECG finding in pericarditis. Now, you need to know that RA is a high yield cause of serious pericarditis, okay? Autoimmune diseases, SLE, okay, another cause. So serious pericarditis, you need to know autoimmune diseases, all right? So pulmonary fibrosis, serious pericarditis, viruses can cause serious pericarditis. That's also assessed on step one material. Fibrinous pericarditis, classically post-MI. Okay, patient can develop uh, pericarditis within days of an MI. It's just called post MI fibrinous pericarditis. Weeks later, two to six weeks later, they can get an antibody mediated fibrinous pericarditis called Dresler syndrome. Non existent yieldness. Students get fanatical about that. Uh, but 
autoimmune disease, okay? I want you to take home from the question, SLE, RA, just in general, autoimmune disease, they can get pericarditis and also pulmonary fibrosis in particular for RA, very important, which makes choice A wrong because in restrictive lung disease, we would have a normal or increased FEV1 over FVC. And decreased, you'd see an obstructive lung disease. The reason you have a normal or increased FEV1 over FEC in restrictive lung disease is due to something called radial traction. It's a term that uh, students have seen in UWorld, but it, it, it's because it's on the NBME. UWorld obviously develops their questions from NBME. The radial traction is a term that refers to stickiness on the outside of the airways in fibrotic lung disease that keeps them open longer uh, than they theoretically could be, which means your FEV1 uh, doesn't decrease as much in comparison to obstructive lung disease where we don't have radial traction. Wrong fucking answer. You know the deal. I'm going to make more content. If you like my stuff, subscribe to my channel. And I appreciate your time. That's it.